Oh, hi there. Welcome back to the Agassino Zynga Show with me, your host, Agassino Zynga. This is episode number 231, Dos Tres Uno. Welcome back, everybody. Right, it's been a bit of a weird couple of weeks, a bit of a weird few weeks, a bit choppy, a little bit inconsistent, haven't been uploading as usual, you know, that malarkey, blah, 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 blah. But as I said in a previous episode, no need to explain, no need to expound or get a bit detailed. The best thing to do in these kind of circumstances is just to get back to work. Jump back on that horse, jump back on that train, jump back on that bike, jump back on your saddle, jump back on that ledge, whatever it may be, and get back to work. And here I am. I'm on that ladder. I'm wiping away windows. I'm painting walls. I'm digging into flipping pavements and shit. Do you know what I mean? Like a construction worker. I'm back at work, back getting it on, back live and direct from YouTube, from your podcast app, wherever you listen to it. Right now, I'm back in the building and my actions always speak louder than words so no more needs to be said but apart from that i hope you guys are doing well i'm doing amazing as you can tell i'm very pumped um couple of days of fasting couple of days of keto couple of days of running all the time you just feel fucking refreshed a bit of meditation a bit of reading a bit of just force you know foresight you know thinking and dreaming about things that you want to do and putting your plans into place writing things down taking some action as well because that's the main thing people don't take enough action let's take some action i'm doing some action i'm doing some things i'm making it happen and here i am feeling good feeling amazing talking directly to you to you my lovely listeners and viewers wherever you may be um so before we get into anything and we get a bit too deep where have i been i went to berlin right so i went to the Bergheim, as you can see there from my little wristband i mentioned last um in last episode but i didn't really expand it or say anything more about it but i went to Bergheim. it was absolutely amazing as per usual i spent a little weekend in berlin had had a great time you know chilled out did the whole chilling out thing and you know screwing around the city so what, what are my learnings of berlin so far um I'll, specifically that I don't think I'm ever going to go back again in the winter. <laughs> I say it every time I go, but when I come back, I'm like, hmm, maybe there's a reason why people don't, people tend to, maybe there's a reason why whenever I tend to look at for apartments um, to stay in, in Berlin during the winter, I find tons. And whenever I try to look during the summer, I don't find any, right? Because usually people don't like to be at, in Berlin when it's cold. They usually leave and let the tourists come around. With them. So, you know, that's the, my general kind of thinking behind it um also the city is great in the winter because you know everything's open late at night you can just go and peruse around you can kind of cruise the streets find a little cool bar to sit in find a little nice restaurant get something to eat you know talk to some strangers meet some friends whatever it may be cool whatever you want to do but i think really the beauty of that city definitely is in the summer because some of their open air parties some of their things happen in the streets happen in the parks cannot be replicated anywhere else i think if you want to, you can probably replicate the club culture there a little bit if you wanted to. Again, it's not it's not easy because some of the magic does come from stuff that's kind of intangible, right? The door selection policy, the way they um, handle drugs and alcohol there is a bit different. Just the attitude towards clubbing is a bit different. So there is a kind of certain panache, a certain sort of sheen, a certain sort of secret ingredient you can't probably replicate. But what you could replicate is just the clubs, right? And the timing. You can, you can push all the clubs to be open until 4 make them open all around the all around london or around your city where you're based in and you can essentially copy the same sort of light, light, light life ecosystem but the one thing you can't copy is how they treat their outdoor spaces or their outside spaces right they're very um they're very keen to kind of utilize spaces that aren't being utilized you know during the summer months and just turn them into like i don't know a, a major you know open air festival or you know kind of concert thing or a, a stage show or karaoke thing, whatever it may be called there's always something happening outside that you can suddenly go to for free you can grab a beer from a from a local news agent the spat cuffs and stuff and just drink and just check out what's going on and and then through that kind of checking out what's going on you get to connect to some people get talking and it always does like that there's always a lot of um that's the thing that things that you can't replicate there's that there's that sense of um that sense of just like things just happen by chance in Berlin a lot. Like you can just hang out there, be talking to someone in the in the in the, in the toilet queue, or be talking to somebody at the bar, and suddenly you made a friend. Suddenly you guys are connected. Some suddenly you guys are now kind of lifelong Facebook friends, and you're just passing tunes to each other, or you're recommending stuff, or you go to another party with them. It can always it can suddenly go from like one place to another really really quickly. Um, that kind of you know, spontaneity is something you can't re- replicate somewhere else. But the open air you can't re- replicate. But I reckon the best time to go is definitely the summer. I had a lot of fun this time around anyway. That that being said, I happened to go to 
the Bergheim. I went. Uh, I didn't have. I didn't get to go to Grease Mule. I went to go to Cocktail de la Mort, the really famous um, legendary club night that they have at Grease Mule. But I, I didn't get a chance to go there in the end. Um, where else I intend to go to? Um, I went to quite a few places. Didn't I? I remember where I went to. I went to Bergheim. Uh, I went to Co- I went to Club Div. No, not Club. Div- I went to Hopstadt. Whatever that that thing on the on the boat next to Club Division. Like Club Division is a bit. It's kind, of, it's kind of it's still i think not being renovated but i'm not sure if the advertisement it's open or not but i didn't even bother going i went to straight to that hop place a little boat next to club division there was i went to burger mice had a burger there i went to loads of other kebab places i did the whole round in berlin i had a great time but burger was the main place i wanted to go to and as you can see i have the main i have the new wristband here right that they've that that was much of the debates around i kept it on just for the podcast right i'm gonna take it off after i finish because it's kind of irritating my wrist um yeah, so the, this has been a lot of debate around this wristband, right? So it's now 18 euros to get in. I think previously it used to be like 15 euros, and now it's got sort of the date of where you went. Can you see that on the camera a little bit? Can you see that? Uh, it's got a date kind of of when I went and the price, right? So um, it used to be 15 euros, now it's 18 euros. Now they also charge a 5 euro re-entry fee to people coming in. And I think part of the reason why people were getting upset behind it, it was a little boycott that didn't really last too long. It kind of went on for about, you know, two minutes on the internet then people started to get a grip and started to realize that it wasn't that big of a deal but i think part of the reason why people are upset because they got rid of the stamps right the stamps were the kind of legendary thing about Bergheim. you go and get a stamp and it'll be something funny it might be faggot it might be some weird illustration just something quite cool right you could always kind of like you know um uh, you can always kind of date the time that you went to berlin based on the stamp that you received on your little wrist yeah so now the stamps are going it's got wristbands it kind of you know maybe remind you of more of a commercial club maybe the fact that the price has gone up maybe the fact that it's a five euro entry fee that was not necessarily something they did previously was free which is something again that most, probably most clubs wouldn't do i know some club especially ones in london tend to charge you a uh, well, they would rush they would much prefer you just pay a higher entry fee for the 24-hour access as opposed to them having to recharge every time you come through the door Right, so it feels like a if you had to get a pass to go to warehouse project or to go to fold for twenty four hours, they'd much rather you pay thirty pounds to have an entry that allows you to go in and out anytime you want, than they're having to pay you. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. Or what they do is that then if you did pay for a ticket that you can only get in for a particular set of time, like imagine if you got a ticket that only allows you to get in before one a.m., they'll then make sure that ticket would say in small print that there's no re-entry. Right, so they kind of locked you in that regard. But um, I think the fact that Bergheim, one of the biggest clubs in the world, allowed you to go in and out of the nightclub when you want is amazing, right? Obviously, because most of the time, most of the reason why I do it is because of health and safety, I'm assuming, right? You can't have people locked into your nightclub for four days in a row, right? From Friday night to like Monday morning, doesn't make any sense. But I think by and large, it's just a great model because it kind of makes people want to pace themselves a lot more. So for me, I ended up sleeping the Sunday morning, no, the Saturday night. Woke up early Sunday morning, got to the Berghain at like 6 a.m. in the morning, no queue, walked straight in, um, or had the queue for like five minutes. Um, the bouncer was super cool. Um, usually I found the bouncers, usually I find, <laughs> obviously, because everyone knows this, usually I find the bouncers that aren't Sven are usually the safest to get in with. Because when it's Sven and his crew, they are on they are on job. Like, they do not fuck around. Like, people are getting fucking rejected left, right, center, nine, 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 nine. It's all over, but everyone's getting nine. You get a nine, you get a nine, right? But when it's um the early morning crew that, that that's not that, that's when that isn't kind of on set, I'm sure he's somewhere around watching stuff on CCTV and stuff, but he's not at the door. It's a lot easier to get in. It's a lot more calm. I feel a lot more chill. There's a lot more banter happening. It's just a lot more, I don't know. I've, I, I've always, I realize the vibe is a bit different. And also, Saturday night, Friday night is fucking peak time to go. That's when everyone, all the party people are going. And again, it probably makes sense because some people would much rather go Friday, Saturday, and then leave Berlin on Sunday night, get to work on a Monday, and you're all ready to go. But, you know, people like me, you know, experienced ravers, you want to go, or not experienced ravers, people that want to experience the whole thing, um, not to kind of give myself a, a hand job, but you'd kind of want to go Pacific, you wanna, you'd, you'd probably wanna ideally go from Saturday to Sunday, or from Sunday to Monday, at least, just to kind of get a vibe of the place. So I walked in at about 6 a.m. in the morning, pretty easy to get in, fairly easy, got in very calmly. Um, searched all the malarkey you could get to do and then kind of got my, my wristband and was able to go. But then what I realised is that I think they are offering people, if you're really um, annoyed about the stamps, they are offering you like a kind of nostalgia sort of like stamp on the wear if you want to. You can just speak to the guys in the, in the kind of desk in the kind of ticket office and they can give you a stamp if you want. So that's something that you can kind of alleviate in that regard. But and also I think for what it offers, you know, I really don't feel having any complaints about a re-entry fee. I didn't, I didn't go back in again. I just stayed in all, all the way until Monday morning and then left 
went back to my Airbnb, slept, and then came back Tuesday morning. Um, but I, I did have an issue with it personally. Um, of course, you walk in, you hear the flipping music coming at you from all, all flipping angles. Uh, the bass just hit in your face. Um, you walk, walk up to the flipping um, cloakroom. Oh, and uh, again, a little notice about the cloakroom, right? Don't do what I did. When you get to the cloakroom, they give you a little necklace thing that you kind of, as a little... Instead of a ticket chip, you get a sort of necklace thing that you then kind of give back when you want to get your stuff. Don't put that necklace around your neck. I put it around my neck and I've got some nasty rash on me. So imagine the amount of people that must have worn that necklace, right? Raving or doing whatever they're doing in the dark rooms, right? And I decided to put that shit on my neck. Like, don't do it. I guarantee you, please do not do it. Uh, Bird guy. Let's see if someone's got a cloakroom necklace. Let's see. Um... It's not a good thing to do. It's not a necklace. It's something you just put in your pocket or, I don't know, you put it maybe around your waist or something. But don't put it in your flipping thing. It's, it's, a, it's a very, very bad thing to do. Um, let's see if I can get a picture of it here, actually. No, I don't think anyone's got a picture of it on it. But anyway, um, it was great. Had a, had an awesome time. Not going to lie. Um, loads of fun was had in the Ber- Bergheim. I saw Crystal Clear. I saw Roxy Moore. I saw Ben Clock playing, right? Resident. I've not seen him play at Bergheim ever before. So, a resident DJ playing at Bergheim was amazing. Um, and just as everything in the back, just come, now when you come to Bergheim, especially when I went, I went through, um, I went another way. I don't, I don't know which way I went. Which way did I go from? From Alexander Platz? I forgot which way. I went from another end, right? But um, you kind of pass by the building works where there's kind of like a massive mud mountain where they're kind of doing some building works next to the Bergheim. You kind of jump over a puddle and you kind of go through these gates that I've got here on the screens. And then um, and then you kind of approach this massive, big, flipping, cubist, um, you know, brutalist building that is the Bergheim. And you see all these shadows in the mirror, in the windows, dancing and having a good time. It's so fucking fun, man. Just looking at it, it just... You feel so excited. That's what. That's the thing I forgot. I forgot to mention about Bergheim. You just. You just get excited about Raven. You get excited about listening to electronic music. You get excited about techno. And usually, I think for most of the time, I'm not sure about you guys, but living in London, that excitement only comes from lineups. Usually, right? That's why some some promoters are very hesitant about releasing set times and all that stuff because they're fearful that partners are only going to come and see the DJs that they've booked. The big headline, right? They, they, they want they want to make sure people come from like ten. They don't want you to just come at one when the big headline is going to come, so they can make him a lot of money at the bar and get their returns. Blah blah blah. But the exciting thing about those lineups is the lineups. It's not the actual club itself. You don't really care about the club, right? You're just excited about a lineup. Um, there's there's probably a handful of clubs in London that you go to that you're excited to actually go to that place and hang out, right? Um, I think even from back in the day, I can say maybe the only place that was kind of like that, it wasn't even like, it was more like a, it was a dive bar for the most part, was the Alibi, right? And that was because you know, I, I had a kind of an affinity with it. I did some nights there. I, had, I met some good friends there. It came during a very pivotal moment in my life. You know, that age between 18 and 21. Oh, yeah, yeah, 18 and 25 where you're kind of, you know, you're still malleable and you're starting to get to know yourself and you're discovering your taste and your interest and all that stuff, Malaki. So it kind of, it, it became a bit more, but there's rarely that I go out where I'm very excited to go to a club in London. I'm also excited to go see who's playing in there. But the bird kind is the opposite of that. You're actually excited just to go inside that place. You don't care who the fuck is playing, right? So I could have been very hell bent on making sure I came there exactly on the time that I wanted to go see a DJ. But I, I just woke up whenever I woke up. And when I woke up, I happened to come at a time when all my DJs I wanted to see were playing. But I wasn't rushing to go see someone play, rushing to a dance floor. I was just taking my time, taking it all in, queuing up listening to everyone in, the, in, the, in front of the door like getting getting told yes i can come in and that kind of your your heart your sinking feeling when you finally get in there because this is people always say it's all well and good it's people say oh if you get heavy from the burger it's not a big deal because you always go somewhere else yes you could right but you want to go in there right so if you, if you get told no you have to then suddenly start making up other plans and it's like it, you know it's just oh, i was just so happy man and you finally get in you hand to the cloakroom even just a cloakroom, you've got all those seats just in front of the cloakroom where people are sitting down and they all look amazing. Everyone's got their great club outfits on and you're just seeing all the people coming out of the toilets from the other side and then you walk in and there's this massive flipping staircase. You've got to walk up that just looks amazing and it's just the beat, all the music is thumping in your ear and you just, it's just a, it's sense, there's so much sensory overload in there. It's just hard to really, it's, 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 it's another one, it's a kind of those places where no matter how much, no matter how well you review it, no matter how detailed your review is, nothing's ever going to beat you actually going there yourself. Nothing, nothing. You have to just go and see it with your own eyes. And then all the times you've been you've been rejected, all the times you've heard people say it's been a horrible place and all the weird stories you've heard will suddenly all make sense and all the rejections you, you received in the past will suddenly be worth it. That one occasion you get in. And so far, 
I've been, always got in when I'm on my own, right? Um, I've only got, not got in once, so I've been with a few group of lads, but um, incredible. Panorama Bar's got some new speakers, by the way. You know, previously they had those massive speakers hanging on chains that are kind of facing, the monitors that are facing. Sometimes I think the DJ in the crowd, that these massive monitors hanging are really awesome. It's like sort of like a, like in a, but, like in a meat shop, right? On a butcher's where it's all sort of hanging by a massive chunky chain, these big speakers. But now they have these silver cans, these silver little sort of tins that kind of point outwards. So that's a kind of a different thing to get used to. Um, in the Panorama Bar, Berk, uh, the Bergheim dance floor is just, you forget, you know how, you forget how dark it is in there, man. It's so fucking dark on the main dance floor, but it's so, it's such a weird balance between they get it. It's so dark, but it's really light too. You can see, you know, in front of yourself, you can dance, you can have movement. And there's another thing as well about Burkhine and Panorama, bro. It's the only place you go to where you actually get tired and you want to sit down because you're dancing too much. You are dancing, not standing around chatting shit or you know, going to the bar a million times, or going to the toilet a thousand times, you're actually having a good time and having a dance. That's the thing that is honestly one of the, forget all the, you know, the door entry thing and the selection policy and all that malarkey and the cheap drinks and the great lineups and the good licenses. There's something about what they've been able to cultivate or maybe it's just the maturity of the crowd that go to a place like that where they're actually there for the music and they want to dance. It's something you don't get a lot in London in, in general. I think for me personally, the only place where you can see people dancing and having a good time is maybe a bachelor party. Because it's quite hard to just stand around at a bachelor party, right? Everyone's going to be whining and dancing. Maybe some Afrobeats night would be a quite good one. Some hip-hop nights too in London, in London or in the UK. Are, they always go off. People are actually dancing and having a good time. And oddly enough, some indie nights. Some like, you know, some indie nights you might find in King's Cross and stuff. Where people are actually singing along to tracks that they've kind of, you know, always grown up loving and stuff. But for the most part, apart from that, all the house techno sometimes nights, they're not. people are not really dancing. There's a lot of like hanging out. Maybe that's where, maybe maybe that's kind of what the London scene's about. Like, if you've ever seen the London Boiler Room um, and people aren't really dancing, but they're just hanging out, that's basically what most of our clubs are like um, with that kind of music, with house, techno, deep house, electro. Maybe drum and bass is the only exception I can think of it where I've been to a drum and bass party and, and actually left and my legs have been aching. Um, but yeah, that was one thing I've just realized. Like, fuck, man, I'm, I'm actually tired. I'm actually knackered. Um, but yeah, I had a great time in the Bergheim. I, I loved it. As you can see, the, the wristband is still on my wrist. Um, great times to be had. Um, loads of cool, amazing people that I managed to bump into. I didn't get my bloody New Rock boots. I ordered a pair of New Rock boots I was going to wear when I went to the Bergheim, but they didn't get delivered in time, so I'm pissed off. But, you know, it is what it is. I'm able to wear my Ricks, some Dr. Martins, sleeveless T-shirt, you know, just doing the damn thing there. And yeah, man, it was, it was awesome. I, I'm not going to lie. It was fucking awesome. Seeing that when you're walking in, in, the, in at night, or I walked past at night time so i was walking around i saw the queue and everything that was a good vibe but coming in the morning and seeing the shadows too is so cool just in the mirror i saw it in the windows like it's sort of like weird window pane kind of covered and when you're in there in the in panorama bar and the light is seeping through it's just it's beautiful man i honestly i just can't say anything there's there's no i can't say any more good words about it man it's one of it's one of my favorite places to go to and i can't wait to get back there again but yeah what a great place um Berghain amazing venue amazing entry place and yeah oh yeah someone had a laboratory t-shirt too um that was awesome um someone had a laboratory t-shirt um this is like this is like the mo the more undercover um berlin berkheim associated clubs it's mostly aimed at um gay men for the most part i think there are a lot of fetish nights that go on there someone had a t-shirt of it and merch there that was fucking cool i, w I wish they sold berkheim merch at berkheim which they probably wouldn't because it's not something they'd want to do but that'd be so cool it's a t-shirt with the kind of flyer that they design on there or whatever for the month that'd be super cool I, i'd be so, so down to wear that but yeah um i recommend anyone that is obsessed with club culture as much as i am to go um a great place um again somewhere that i'll easily go back to again i'll probably end up going back there again in november or something I, I know i said i won't go back in the winter but it's just too good of a venue to go to back to not not to go back to again um again yeah so Berghain 2019 holiday was incredible uh, I'm, I'm trying to go every year because you know it's good to kind of get yourself inspired i think the thing is the most thing and also to kind of know where the levels are i think sometimes i can get a little bit too cocky and i can think i'm a little bit better than what i actually am by staying in london right because some of the djs here are a bit shit for the most part um but when you go to berlin or when you go to like when you go see actual big nights out you're like okay cool there's levels to shit even though i think i'm good i'm not as good as these guys these guys are like you know upper echelon stuff and you know i saw miss kitten there as well that was awesome like oh just awesome 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 night i really recommend you check it out if you have opportunity to go of course there's loads of 
articles out there about how you can get in easily and all that malarkey but as long as you're appreciative of the music you understand the culture you're about you're about having an actual good time in there you're not just there for the fucking hype and you approach it in the right way i'm sure you'll be fine there's also there's some common things you should look out for that you can always google on the internet but you know for the most part i really recommend just at least getting in there once it's so much it's so worth it and again if you don't get in there there is always other options to go to in berlin so it's not like a wasted trip but i really recommend you check it out um again um i know i don't need to sell the brand kind to anyone on here anyway i'm sure most of my listeners are aware of what that place is um so moving on in the complete opposite of Bergheim, it's gonna it's october right so what does that mean sober october that's what it means it's sober october month so this month or this year like most years there's always something in between so either i've got a, a trip planned or a holiday uh, there's always something that happens so i never even start i think the only time i've started sober october on the 1st of october has been 2017 i think for the most part every, every year there's always something that pops up so unfortunately i've missed nine days of sober october so i'm having to start today so i'm starting today and i'm probably going to end it i don't know november 9th right just going to end it when i start whatever so the, the 9th of november i'll end it so that's going to be on a saturday so that should be a good time to get wasted and whatever malarkey but I want to kind of reset myself as well. Um, I think in that regard, I think this year has been a bit of a tough one in general. Loads of movement in terms of jobs, loads of movement in terms of friends, loads of movement in terms of career trajectory, in terms of side businesses. Loads of stuff is happening in terms of family stuff. Just loads of pandemonium. And I think in general, sober October or just times or just in general uh, an occasion for you to kind of reset and to not do the things that you normally do is always a good it's always a good thing to do right to to kind of specify one time in the year or one day or one month or one week that you kind of try to do things the right way right you try and live a more honorable life you try to do things um when you say you're gonna do them you try to follow through with things you try to put your best foot forward in order to set some good habits or set some good patterns in play right because we know habits are usually something that's built up over a short over like a prolonged period of time you do stuff um enough times with enough repetition that hopefully along the way you'll have to build it up as a habit it'll become you know attached to you it'll become intrinsic because of it you just do about thinking and it can carry on to and it can carry on and maybe have influence in all the other things that you do so this month i'm aiming to obviously not do any alcohol not take no drugs i mean even weed nothing nothing's gonna be happening on that on that end um, I'm aiming to eat keto or completely clean for the entirety of the month. I'm aiming to do intermittent fasting from uh, which is 16 8. So I'm going to be eating within an eight hour window and fasting for 16 hours a day for seven days a week. I'm seeing how that's going to go. And I should be pretty fine with that. I'm going to be aiming to read a book. Um, I'm, so I'm aiming to read two hours a day. Um, I'm aiming also to do one hour of language learning, which is specifically going to be Spanish because of the misses and stuff. And those are the main kind of things that I'm kind of covering. There's going to be some other stuff on top of it that I might include into it, but those are the main areas I'm covering. My fitness, obviously, I'm going to be running and training uh, five days, five to five to six days a week. And um, yeah, so it's running, training. I want to write this down as well, actually, because I'm, I want because I think writing down. I don't know about you guys, but I remember when I used to write down my little goals and my list and stuff and tick them off. They used to, be, I used to kind of get a long way to kind of achieving them as opposed to just having them in your mind. I think writing them down is really important. So, like I said, I'm gonna be sticking to no booze, no drugs. Um, I'm gonna be making sure that I'm eating clean. I'm gonna be making sure that I'm fasting 16 to 8 using the app zero so i can check that out um zero is available now on the app store it's completely free super easy app to use i should have my phone somewhere around here to show you guys but it's a really cool app that i'm using now currently actually to fast so you can see since when i've been fasting but it's a really easy app to use it's all like that you just kind of tap it and you tap the screen when you're starting to fast you tap it when you're about to end it and pretty intuitive to use i'm doing a 16 8 fast as you can see there, the intermittent fasting just down on top as you can see um so yeah we're gonna do that running training all that stuff and then hopefully by the end of the month i'm in a far better mental and physical space there might be an opportunity for me to include some meditation in there um to do that once a day as well i haven't done that this morning so that might be a bit of a dud but let's see if i can do that going forward it's a bit difficult to do so very new habit for me but i think 10 minutes a day trying too fast will be a good way to kind of get myself back into where i want to go to like centered wise right in terms of mind body and soul so that's the kind of hope that i'm going through but yeah so october is starting and i'm really i'm honestly I'm, I'm super pumped for it man i think i think this has come at right a really crucial time for me to do so october i think a lot has happened over the last few months that i kind of want to rectify and get back to uh you know get back on a good page i think i kind of lost my way a little bit the last few months or last few weeks specifically and I need to kind of get myself realigned where I am before because, again, you know, you always have this 
delusion of grandeur or i've always had a, a, a sense of um you know yeah you know delusion about where i am and who i am and where i'm going but i think sometimes life can really smack you in the face and let you know no 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 here's where you actually are and these are always a good opportunity to kind of reset and get yourself back to where you need to get to again it's not for everybody i wouldn't recommend doing this sort of stuff to everyone because some people can't necessarily let go of their vices or they can't necessarily um dedicate some time to some sort of sense of purity cleansing whatever maybe but i need to do it man i really need to do it. i think this this is the, really the time for me to do and hopefully going forward uh, end the year really strong as well it's a good opportunity as well to end the year quite strong and to carry on some good habits into the new year because you know we all know uh, news news resolutions are a bunch of crock shit especially if you're not starting to do some of the work in the beginning um and some of the reason why i thought it would be a good idea was this really insightful video that i saw on def jam's twitter that popped up of our guy kanye west when he used to you know when he when he was more uh, agreeable um speaking the good truth in this kind of message about you know what you can do when you put your mind to it, kind of you know that kind of achieving all things mentality so i'm going to play this quickly and then move on to the next subject this kind of kind of this kind of basically infuses why i'm at where i am at with my sober october thoughts in general so let's see if we can get this to play Here's Kanye talking to Charlie Rose. Now, any limit to your ambition? No. Or any limit to what you think you can achieve? No. Well, no. Because I think right now, if I was to quit rapping and I say I want to go to the NBA, I would be in the NBA. No, you wouldn't. Yes. No, you wouldn't. Yes, I would. No, you wouldn't. Yes, I would. Why would you think you could make it to the NBA? Because I think I can do anything. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever played basketball? Yes, I did. Were I was you pretty okay? good. Were you yeah. pretty good? Yeah. And the thing, I, I wasn't natural at all, but I ended up being on a team and, and winning championships and um, being the point guard. You know, and it just came from, like, my, my talent is the ability to learn. If I could play you the tracks that I had when I was, you know, in seventh grade and compare that to a Jesus Walks, All Falls Down, Stand up, overnight celebrity. Hold on, I'm not thinking. I'm gonna name everything. Else. <laughs> uh, <laughs> slow jams. But if I could play you that right now and show you that track, and now I'll go and shoot a jump shot right now and miss it. Yeah. It's the same thing as how my tracks were right back. They, you know, anything in life that you put your mind to, you can do. The world, the world is your oyster. That's all I tell people, and I really have a grasp of that. Being that I, I nearly died. It's, it's, it's this, and it's heaven. Why you're on earth, especially if you're not incarcerated, if you, if you, you got to take advantage of this. And, and that, that, doesn't, that doesn't mean for everybody to be a rapper, for everybody to be a producer. Do what you do to the fullest. And I agree with him, man. That's, you can't really say anything more than that, really. Isn't it? And I've always had that kind of way of thinking. I think that's maybe, it's a blessing and a curse because you can sometimes, you know, there is an aspect of, my personality or people that have that same sort of like drive or that have that same sort of kind of level of conviction where you necessarily don't necessarily pick a lane you're just a bit scattergun you're a bit, a bit of a generalist you don't really have a speciality an expertise of some sort but i think nowadays in the general in the area that we're living in now being an expert in one thing isn't necessarily the best thing for you right you want to necessarily you want to have you want to have your fingers in different pies you want to have your skill set as diversified as possible you want to have a broad set of interest you want to have a different you want to have a broad way of applying the skills that you've learned into different areas right if you're a businessman there's no point just doing business in the sneaker world you want to do it in i don't know party party promotion you want to be able to launch a clothing brand you want to be able to do it in different areas so that you can show that oh look my business acumen is able to be applied in all these different arenas right um same with music right you won't necessarily want to be a producer just making hip-hop you want to be making a, a whole breadth of music that covers the entire you know genre or that covers that covers the entire sonic scape or whatever that's happening at the moment and i think that's generally where I've kind of been at, but again, it takes a lot of drive, it takes a lot of determination, it takes a lot of you kind of putting your blinkers on and just ignoring everything else that's going on left to the right of you. I mean, I think, again, Sober October is a good opportunity to do that because it kind of affords you the opportunity to kind of really focus in because you don't have the distraction of going out and drinking and getting fucked up. The first big test I have is this Saturday, actually, as I'm DJing on the Heathcote and Star um, from 9 to 1. If you're around, check that out. But that's the first big step because in my head, I give myself this narrative that DJing sober is really hard and really difficult and people are drunk and they're all coming over you and it's just all, you know, a bit annoying. But this narrative that I gave myself in my head is just a narrative. It's a story that I'm telling myself. It's not necessarily the truth. So what the truth could be is that 
if I'm a professional, if I really want to do this, if I really believe in myself, if I really believe that I could be a high level DJ, which I do think I can be, if I do believe I could be a high level producer, which I can be, high level label owner, if I could, whatever these dreams I have of owning my own bar and a nightclub, blah, 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 I have to be able to operate in that way, right? I'd be able to do it in a professional manner. And if I can turn up to an, a bar or a club or whatever it may be called and do the damn thing without being intoxicated or be, without being under the influence of any sort of drugs or whatever it may be, then that is me coming closer to my goal. And it's also an example and also a way to me to show that, oh, look, I can do what I put my mind to. I decided today I'm going to do this this way and I did it, right? Um, and yeah, for everything I've done so far, that's been basically my mantra. You know, I think I can do most things because I equate it a lot to football. How kind of equated basketball, you know, I wasn't a gifted footballer. I didn't grow up being very good at football. I had to teach myself how to play football. And then I got really good at playing that game. Um, even running, I'm probably not built for running, right? I'm a big dude, right? I'm, I'm broad. Um, even when I get down to a good weight, I'm still kind of a, a massive dude, right? To be running down the street, you know, trying to get six miles, six minute miles and stuff. But I did it. I kind of made myself into a runner, even though my body probably doesn't lend itself to running. And I think that by and large, you, you, you go from like the beginning where, when I was running 10 minute miles to the end when I was running six minute miles and five minute miles. That is progression. That shows that if I apply that same sort of logic, that same sort of work ethic, that same sort of drive in other aspects of my life, I could be in a better, in a, in a different place. But again, it just requires you to kind of really focus in and, and decide that this is what I'm going to do. There's nothing else that matters. This is what I'm going to do. And again, I think the whole October October thing is a good test because it's 30 days, 30, it's 30 to 31 days of just pure attention, pure drive, pure just like, you know, eye on the prize, just kind of driving forward and not ignoring everything else on the right and to left of you. And then suddenly you get to a point where you want to get to and, you know, you're succeeding where you, where you want to be. So that's the hope that, I'm, that, that I want to achieve now going forward. Um, so yeah, uh, big up everyone on the Sub October train. If you're not on it just yet, um, I recommend you do because you know why not, man? Why the hell not? It's Sub October. Let's get it cracking. Ah, so next topics to get into. Just got to put on my glasses for your potty. Let's do this. What's the next topics I got here? Next topics. Gucci Mane for Gucci. Oh, I'm happy for this guy, man. So Gucci Mane has um been given the blessing and the kind of honor of being um associated now with Gucci itself. Um Alexandra Michelli brought him in. He did a photo shoot with Harmony Corain. Um, I think there was some images that we saw popping up of you know Gucci Mane walking around Milan looking all weird. And then we saw a picture of um you know um him and Kira Galore. Is it Kira Gloria? It's Kira something like that, right? Um, in in but in um, Milan too, and it kind of you know everyone's assuming, hmm, this is weird, isn't it? Why would they suddenly be going to Milan? There has to be something afoot here. And again, it kind of transpired that oh, they're actually doing a deal. They've actually kind of partnered up with Gucci um to do an entire campaign, which looked really great, really incredible. Hopefully, there's some products as well that get tied into it too. That's a Gucci Mane collaboration, but it's just amazing to see his transformation. He's gone from a complete zero or a complete villain to this guy that's completely celebrated. And again, it goes to show that sometimes in life you kind of you you end up making so many mistakes you end up hitting so many hurdles you end up falling over so many times you can sometimes think to yourself you know what is it worth it like am i in the right direction am i going the right way and sometimes life cannot sometimes life isn't like a movie it's not like you do two or three mistakes and then you suddenly get to where you want to get to sometimes it can be just be years and years of absolute abject failure just completely fucking up again and again and again and again but the thing about life, the thing about most things is that it's all about persistence. It really is just about just continuing on and just keeping your head down and just continue to work. Because what I've realized over the years, especially with people in the scene, when it comes to street, where it comes to fashion, it comes to music, people are hanging around back in the day, the people that have really thrived and people that have really got to where they got, they got their need to get to, whether or not they're talented or not is, is another subject. But what they've done over the years is that they've just persisted. They've just stuck at what they were doing. And just continued getting better and better and better, expanding their network, delivering on their promises, um, you know, securing work, putting out personal projects. They just they just persisted in that lane, and over time, because everyone else falls off, you become the only de facto person to rely upon, and you've got a whole, you know, a catalog of work that you've done over the years, right? So you essentially, you of course you're going to get the job. But then for people that are a bit short sighted and don't necessarily see the bigger picture, you can look at that from the outside and be like, "Oh my god, how did he or she get the role? I'm better than her or him." But it's like, yeah, you might be better than her or him in your head or maybe you know on paper, but 
um, the evidence doesn't really show that, right? And they've been present. They've been around all these years, just pers consistently persisting, going, going, going. And I guess Gucci Mane is a certain, sort of, certain kind of regard as well, right? It's sort of, he's become like the de facto godfather of Atlanta hip hop um, in general, right? That kind of trap sound. People are now respecting him even more so. And the fact that he's suddenly turned, he's um, transformed his mind and his body has been something that people have been very aware of, right? Like he's gone from looking like what he looked to in the past to now looking absolutely incredible. And it's not something that you can kind of fake. It's something that only comes with hard work, effort, determination, all that malarkey. It's not something that comes with, there's no pill, there's no shortcut. There's nothing that you can do that doesn't, that's not going to get you there apart from just pure hard work and grit. And yeah, man, like Gucci Mane is just an entire inspiration for all everyone involved. Look, just go look at him. Look how good he looks, right? This is this is him on. The, I've got him on the screen here from Instagram, La Flair, at ten seventeen. I'm sure you guys are aware of, but um, yeah, look how great he looks. He just looks amazing. He went from this to something else straight away. He's completely crafted himself into. Now he looks like a flipping CrossFit athlete. Do you know what I mean? Looks insane. Look at that. Look, look at how good he looks there. It's an old picture of him there with his pot belly out just looks incredible absolutely insanely good he's got some good before after pictures or look look how ripped he looks there look at that absolutely jacked but yeah he's a huge, he's a huge inspiration to me personally mind body and soul transformation is on another level complete inspiration really smashed it over the years and again the whole gucci collaboration thing is another example of just how um well he's done over the years um i've got the collaboration here video i wanted to quickly show you guys that kind of details and again it only it can only bring a little tear to your eye watching this man if you're a fan of gucci man because this is just incredible to see where he's come from and now suddenly you know he's been flown to milan for gucci in order to you know film this amazing campaign video they did in harmony Corain. just incredible stuff um it's let's play, it's play it here quickly so you see it put some sound on there i can't even flinch let's see. I, I don't know i'm feeling myself out here in rome mm -hmm. I really am i can't even flinch our clothes been dope at this, at this shoot um all the people I've been working with even look how he sounds see how clear he sounds he doesn't suppose he doesn't drink or smoke anymore and you can tell he just sounds so clear clear minded clear headed right it's just everything is clear now he's just crystal clear where his path is meant to be and again I think when you've seen so much darkness in your life as Gucci Mane this path of light is just so easy to kind of you know walk down along right especially when you've got your, your missus next to you everything's in place you've got good business acumen just it just is what it should be. It's just amazing to see. It was like it wasn't even like work. It's been fun. Great dude. Great energy, Sandra Mercedes, McKinley vibe, there with Gucci. You know, so cool, man. Me, 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 him, and talking to him, chopping up. I can tell you got a good heart, man. Good spirit. And this the jeweler who makes it. Uh, yeah, but uh, the, the, the marine chain is super chic. I never been this relaxed. I had this much fun. It's, you know, wow. It's so cool. So bright, man, it might blind your sight, but I'll tell you, you better close your eyes. <laughs> I am not playing with you. Yeah, they cut his pair and they big as pairs. <laughs> 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 so fucking cool man I'm so happy from honestly I'm really happy for him it's just you don't Gucci Cruise 2020 Gucci Mane promoting it honestly you can't get any better than that that's that's the that is um, probably the archetype of a hero's journey right Joseph Campbell that is a hero's journey like he had to go through the mud he went through the mud to get to where he's going to now look at him now look how he's thriving now look how he's prospering look how look, look at how he's shining right in this arena just looking like a million bucks I love the guy man Absolutely amazing. Definitely recommend you check it out. Um, campaign photography uh, by Harmony Corain. But yeah, good good stuff from all involved. And again, just good work from Gucci too. They put their money where their mouth is after the whole, you know, blackface stuff. They've really gone, you know, above and beyond to make sure they rectify things. It's done in a very classy way. Nothing too pastiche, nothing too obvious. They didn't send out a million black models on the runway. Nothing too stupid. Just really tasteful ways to kind of correct the wrongs that they've done in the past. And again, slowly but surely they'll get there. And that's why I don't believe in cancel culture, right? Because if you cancel Gucci, will they ever learn? You obviously can't cancel them anyway, but will they learn? Will they get to a better place? Will they educate themselves? Will they be able to educate their consumer? Educate the market? Educate the other brands? No. They're this way, this slowly, again, it's a bit heavy-handed with the whole, like, you know, cultural, um, what they call cultural sensitivity directors and whatever they're called that they're hiring in fashion, but at least it's something. At least they're doing something. That's great. And back in the in days gone by, these companies would just ignored it, right? And just carried on churning out offensive product after offensive product. But at least they're acknowledging where they are. Uh, this is probably one of the good things about social justice, isn't it? The fact that this a big company like Gucci can acknowledge um, 
such a social faux pas and try and do better next time around. I think it's great to see, man. I'm happy for good, happy for everyone involved. And again, awesome, awesome campaign. What else is next on the list? Boom, boom, boom. Oh, Balenciaga, Spring Summer 20. Of course, you know me, big Demna fanboy. Um, I thought this was probably one of their strongest seasons as to date so far. I've been a big fan of some of the suiting they've been putting out. Some of the tailoring has been super amazing. Um, they switched up the shoes this time around. There's a lot of motocross-inspired trainers, um, which kind of goes away from some of the track shoes they've done in the past or some of the stuff that I have like this. And the triple s as well they're kind of moving away from that sort of vibe and kind of moving more towards the kind of you know slimmer sleeker more square toed foot uh collaborations a bit of a lot of the square toed shoes coming in a few seasons so far i think i might have seen maybe martin rose start that um square toed kind of loafer sort of like african uncle look right there's kind of dolston loafers that used to get back in dolston market back in the day um but yeah, so far I think it's maybe their strongest collection so far. I'm a real big fan of it. Um, here's here's the Vogue Runway uh, review from one Sarah Moa, as per usual. This is a kind of review I'll quickly read out that kind of kind of excuse what I'm speaking or you know kind of expounds on some of the things I'm talking about. Um, it says the following: um, Fashion people are constantly uh, racking their brains about what makes fashion relevant. Uh, but there's no one like Demna uh, for ushering an audience into a situation where the state of the world affairs can bite so viscerally. He set his Balenciaga spring collection in a political arena, a fur Balenciaga parliament or assembly, which he convinced, which he convened to investigate the subject of power dressing and fashion uniforms, which was really cool. It kind of looked like some UN assembly hall. You know, those kind of big circle rooms where people are sat in circles and they all speak and they have those little headsets on and listen to kind of other leads around the, uh, around the European Union speaking and stuff. It looked, it looked kind of similar to that. Very, very interesting. Everyone had lanyards on that malarkey too. So there we sat in an auditorium. Devna had pointed uh, had pointed smooth, smoothly, uh, wall to wall in coloured in colour, not off uh, the blue of the EU flag, to view his socio design study of the structure of today's dress codes. Senior delegates, women and men in tailoring, a severe anonymous idea, uh, identical suited corporate presence opened the show. Who were they? On the breast pockets were embroidered badges. Two disc uh, biscuits with Balenciaga logo construct or not dissimilar to the Mastercard design. Lo I love these little flips he does. Or the whole that's that's where this East Street accessibility is come in. Taking you know corporate brand logos, flipping them and using them in his own sort of way. Uh, then came what uh, them called the campaign dresses. We looked at pictures of women politicians and of what they were wearing in the campaign. We took this type of tailoring. They would they dread they wear dresses and try to make it cool. Not an easy challenge to be honest. He said his solution was to make them more boxy and cocoony which is quite Balenciaga. So many body types can wear it. Democratic and easy to wear volume, which I'm a big fan of, of course. All the while, the bombastic, pounding, semi-militaristic horror movie soundtrack essentially filled the space, mixed by Lot Gomez, uh, Dem and his partner. The cast of characters, they were named in the show. Notes of the doctors, lawyers, gallerists, engineers, where professional models kept it on coming. The closer you looked, the more you saw the Protostatically augmented jutting of cheekbones and blow up lips. It was a subtle terrifying. It was honestly cool. That's the best thing he does. Right? He get his partner to do the soundtrack. He's got all these interesting models, cast and runway, which again I think is something I mentioned previously in another episode about casting. There's a lot of that shit casting in fashion nowadays that you know when you harken back to days of Comme des Garçons, especially sometimes in the eighties when you know um, Alexander McQueen walked the show. There was very there's a lot of interesting people walking the shows. You look at some of the notes and you see, oh that guy's an interior designer, that guy's an architect. Da, 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 da. Nowadays it's always the same especially in milan you get the same fucking you know skinny models walking down the runway and it's you know there's nothing wrong with it but just make it more interesting i'm not necessarily for the whole plus size models you know um being fully embraced on the runway i'm not so sure, sure that's the answer either but it has to be a middle ground where you're somehow able to show the actual woman that buys your thing day to day in the actual that's that's the main beef i had with vetima and benciago when they were first churning out you know runway collection after runway collection full of just you know his friends right that were all kind of you know super white there was nothing wrong with it but the reality of it was after just the first season it was very clear that the people that loved valenciaga that liked vetima and valenciaga when he was designing it were asian people and black people right they were the main people that were kind of driving that brand forward right and really kind of buying it up so why not have those people reflected on the runway they didn't necessarily get it right um but over time they understood and they kind of got round to it and they were able to kind of you know readjust the balance but some of the brands don't necessarily do that they tend to always kind of it's odd that you'd see in an, uh, another one maybe baluti maybe this is a good one where they'll have models on the runway that are like you know under 22 and they can't, they can't afford anything in that store 
but the actual guy that buys it isn't necessarily affected on the run, which is odd. But I guess in their in their uh in their defense, they would probably argue that none of their actual customers that shop in the show in the in the in the show in the um, boutique would actually view a runway collection show, right? They'll just wait for the lookbook to come out and get sent to them by post. I don't know, whatever, I don't know what it is. But anyway, let's continue. Um Relevance in Demna's mind is equal part sharp observation of what people wear and a focus on creating something that somehow relates back to the heritage of Christopher Balenciaga. Agree. So again, this is this is where he's expert merchandising, business acumen, and just you know being able to design clothes as a kind of you know gen- a way to generate money. Right? It kind of comes into it where he's able to take something as you know lofty as Balenciaga and just kind of bring it down democratize it make it um commoditize it in some way shape or form right be able to kind of just give it to you right but it also still have that that sense of luxe that sense of appeal that kind of draw that you kind of really really want to see people you want people to know that you've got that thing on so that's a very very particular skill that takes us to the um uh, uh crino line dresses right at the end almost a child's carbon fantasy in their bouncy silhouettes ballroom dresses go back to the beginning of Balenciaga when Cristobal started in Spain it's mostly his type of silhouette he did with Spanish paintings got sort of a demo observed but he wanted to make them make sure they were wearable if you take out the, the Cyrillin you have a sort of goth dress in the middle there was a dynasty era section with huge shoulders um, what were 22 avatars we felt we feared of God look. so let's look at some of the clothes enough of the review now but I, I, there was so much good stuff here that I was a big fan of but yeah look at some of the clothes again the tailoring I'm a big fan. I love the boxy suits I love the again I love the square toed shoes now that they're kind of you know um, going towards again there was a lot of Mart- Martin Rose a few seasons a few in the back kind of did that I think it might be the, club, the collection that she done when the models were running, walking through the street that was there I saw a lot of square toed shoes in that way again the suits are really great look amazing on massive kind of blazers I'm not really a fan of the short sleeve suit personally myself but you know beggars can't be choosers if i got one I'll, I'll be down with it I love what he did with the cheekbones it's sort of like the prospectics right added in Sort of like again, I think some special effects there done. So a lot of really sharp cheekbones there. Um, some woman got some blow up lips as well. Again, the MA1 jacket, the bomber. You know, is anyone that does a better bomber than Demna really at the moment in fashion? I don't think so. Um, so again, some nice shapes, good silhouettes, great bags. Jackets are always incredible. Exaggerated shoulders. Here you see the blow up lips I'm talking about, right? Um, you got the kind of you know the weird sort of Balenciaga, sorry the the Balenciaga Mastercard logo flip, which is a great look as well. Um, great suiting as per usual. Nice bags. The color combinations are always great. I'm always a sucker. It's something I always do all the time. I always kind of steal the color palettes of runway shows and apply them to my own wardrobe. It's always easy to do. Like you got something like this in your wardrobe, and you got some nice black boots. You know, you you know what to do straight away. But again, she was one of my favorite models. I'm not sure who that model was. Oh, that's her name. Here. Tanya Kat Katsiva. Tanya Kachiva, she she looked fucking incredible. She was really, if you saw a walk, she was super, super more, super goffy and moody looking. I love how they added these kind of like, you know, uh, bags under her eyes, right? Like she's been up all night, kind of securing deals and you know, running back and forth from the fax machine and coming. But I mean, just like I just love it. It just looks really, really real. Um, again, you got this amazing grey suit, really big and boxy, just incredible incredible looking stuff i'm a big big fan of it i love all of it you know the dresses the blanchard do right i'm really surprised that someone like maybe he's he's moved on now young fuck but that would have been a good era for young fuck to be wearing those i know he wore did he wear molly goddard before young fuck he might have but i think the blanchard kind of flow dress would look really good on someone like a young fuck i think he'll, he'd, he'd rock that super cool but again some great silhouettes great suits great long jackets again the black coats are awesome some nice jeans, some big boots. Some of the these derby shoes are really nice too. They remind me a little bit of the Prada boots that came out a while back ago. I think they might have been my favorite collection. Might have been 2004, winter 2011, 2010, when they had this sort of like preppy, sort of like get Ivy sort of style collection that had these really amazing boots that I was a big fan of. They remind me a little bit of that. Again, some nice black boots, some nice black trench coats that are pleated, looks like, right? Pleated, was that pleated or what would you say that is? Pleated or folded, it kind of reminds me a little bit of Isimiyaki. See, see the, the shoes I'm talking about? They're really nice, kind of Oxford boots, like really massive, chunky sole protruding out. Again, the long sleeves are just incredible, exaggerated sleeves, and nice shades there too. That will probably be a big, big draw this coming season. They do always do good shades in that regard. 
just an incredible against collection you can't really deny it great casting as per usual and just overall just incredible i love this this is one of my favorite looks this leather look is incredible this leather biker jacket cinched at the waist it sort of looks like a dress a little bit right it could always, someone's definitely gonna wear that dress one what one of those fashion girls like so good and massive leather trousers with a zip on the side just incredible 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 stuff just such a big fan of all of it man like look look at the detail oh so gorgeous the big pearly earrings lovely comes in white as well black leather jacket great denim suit great tracksuit as per usual they always do awesome track suits um, some of it reminds you of some of the old Lecoq Sportif tracksuits as well. Very subtly done. Some nice piping, you know, um, single color, maybe two or three colors max. Good color blocking, great materials, great shape. This, the the tracksuits are very, very underrated. I know they're probably not as flashy as maybe Gucci tracksuits for some guys, but I, I'm surprised some people, that more road men, don't wear Balenciaga tracksuits. They look really, really good, I think, personally. They look really good, especially the European wear with like Air Maxes and stuff. This, this plaid suit looks really cool too. Um, there are these really amazing long sleeve shirts that had um, Balenciaga written on it and all the A's were basically at so quite cool as well and this is the first look of the new trainers here um, so it's sort of like um, for those listening via podcast app, it's sort of it's got tires in the front it's basically a motocross shoe or boot basically in a low um, it looks very very you know morphed and warped and stuff and it, it probably it probably feels a lot more like a boxing boot very low profile square toed um so i'm interested to see what it's going to look like in real life or you know up close more kind of detailed picture i'm sure we'll be able to find them on instagram maybe soon a nice sort of hto t-shirt i'm sure these shoes are going to fly out here's another image of the of the actual shoe itself there loads of the uh, of the models walking down with um iphones in their hands a lot of great track pants too um, some detailed shots there too. See that HGO t-shirt there. What was that earring he's got on his ear? You can't see. That's a paperclip as well. Okay, awesome. They're carrying an iPhone in their hand as well. That was quite cool to see. Probably going to be another collaboration there. Another iPhone case to check out. Great big shoulders. Another great look there as well. And they've got, they've got some awesome motocross jeans too that I'm a big fan of on there too. Again, just an amazing collection overall. I really want you to check it out. One of my favorites so far from Balenciaga. I'm not going to bother going through the entire thing. They've got a massive crocodile of the veil, like a massive code. I'm sure all the Korean boy bands are going to be all absolutely all over. That's definitely up there in their kind of realm possibility. These massive coats that look amazing. You know, these coats remind me of. Do you remember there was that meme on, on Instagram where everyone was kind of, you know, making um, influencers jackets super big when winter came around? Because, you know, influencers tend to kind of just wear the biggest coats possible to kind of get those looks off on the gram. And there was a thing where everyone was kind of wearing blow up, blow up, blow up jackets. That was cool. So I think we're going to see a lot more of that going forward. Um, what else is there? Loads of suits, loads of suits. But yeah, good stuff all around. Big fan of it. Recommend you check it out. Spring Summer 2020. Again, these dresses are so beautiful. One of my favorite collections so far. From then, oh, Gigi looked amazing, innit? She fucking, I mean, sorry, Bella smashed it this season, man. She was maybe the hottest model out in the runway this season. She was everywhere and looked incredible in every flipping show she was on. So, yeah, big up her. Supposedly, Lotta isn't, isn't, um, Lotta Valkova isn't styling Balenciaga anymore. So, I wonder who's doing it nowadays. Maybe it's them not doing it himself, but I suppose he's, she's not doing it anymore. But, yeah, um, great collection so far i recommend you check it out some great looks in there um all things considered move on move on in move on up what else do we have here uh oh we have loads of uh oh instagram dark mode instagram dark mode is here so as you guys are probably aware I, ios 13 allows you to have dark mode which i've got on my phone enabled now at the moment how am i going to show you dark mode now so that's dark mode I've got now on my phone enabled because you see that on the screen, right? That's dark mode there. It's enabled on my phone, so that's great. But now Instagram's got dark mode, so you don't need to have that stupid white fucking thing flashing in your eyes, which is nice. Um, and this is news that just got launched, I think, recently, past iOS 13 maybe. Um, I'll put it here on the screen now. Um, Instagram dark mode is here. It's from CNN Business. It says the following. Instagram is rolling out a dark mode option. The latest major app 
to to latch onto the eye straining reducing battery saving sheet looking trend that's sweeping the globe the photo sharing app new appearance is similar to its rivals it's embracing the darkness by flipping the default white backgrounds to black and gray instagram made the theme available to ios and android users in the update on monday so awesome to see to activate dark mode just go into your app blah blah blah, blah. So yeah, pretty cool to see, right? That's that's a major, major update. But the biggest update on Instagram that people are really, really excited about and I'm excited about is the removal of the follow tab. So happy about this. Check this out. Check, 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 check this out. So as you're aware, there was a, that was, there was that annoying tab on, on Instagram, right? The follow tab where you could see what your friends were clicking and liking and stuff. And I guess for some people, it was kind of entertaining because you can kind of stalk on your friends or you can find some stuff that they like that you might like as well. You know, maybe a good discovery bit. But honestly, I don't think in the whole entire time that I've used Instagram, and I don't really use it that often anyway, that I've ever clicked on it. I don't necessarily want to not get to see anything. And I guess that also was the reason why people started opening Finster accounts, right? So Finster accounts that were locked and are private that probably you know only your closest friends could use were mainly um set up so you could have an opportunity to kind of you know just do your thing in quiet in peace and quiet right and with no one else noticing so i think the moment they were able to take away the follow tab might maybe then impede the fact that people might maybe slow down the amount of fins and accounts that get opened up and also the fact that they're going to get rid of likes eventually might get rid of the need to have fins account because fins accounts were kind of where you kind of threw up all your you know nondescript loosey goosey kind of having fun um, images up so maybe with the with the introduction with the the removal of the follow tab the removal of the likes you might see people then posting more organic stuff on their main instagram profiles that might be where they're going towards it but it's honestly so great to see and i'm sure for the creeps around the world people that also <laughs> want to just creep on girls without their missus finding out they're probably going to be super happy that the follow tab is completely gone but yeah this is this is news um now i'm from engaging i'm reporting it says the following uh starting this week instagram will sun uh will sunset one of its more infamous le uh, though lesser known features moving forward the app is removing its following tab um reports buzzfeed news if you're unfamiliar with the feature it displays new likes and comments from people you follow it also shows you new accounts that they may have added to their feed it's accessible through the uh the heart tab which is the same part of instagram's interface where you see likes and follows from your account for better or worse, a lot of people found it a bit too much about their friend's interest through their follow tab, of course. And on the other hand, you could see all the great dogos your friends follow. On the other hand, you could see all the Instagram models they like as well. It's a good, so it's not a good scene. Instagram's Vishal Shah told BuzzFeed News the company is removing the feature because it wasn't getting a lot of use, which I'm surprised about because I think there's a lot more people that creep um, on people's profiles than they would like to admit. I think it's something a lot of people do kind of in secret. Or you kind of open up a secret account to view somebody's thing. I, I don't know. I, I just get a feeling that it's a lot more prevalent than people try to make out. People didn't always know that the activity was surfacing. Shah told the website. So you have to, you have, so you have, so you have a case where it's not serving the, case, the the use case that you built it for. But it's also causing people to be surprised when activity is showing up. He went on to add simplicity was always a driving factor. Instagram first added the following thing back in 2011. However, as a way of discovering new accounts and photos, the app's Discover tab does much better job of surfacing. Of course, because Discover tab, especially if you're liking a lot of stuff, the algorithm will probably start noticing your trends and what you're liking and what you're clicking on. And it'll start to recommend really interesting stuff. And for the most part, most people's discovery tab on Instagram is a fair reflection of what their interests are. It's not necessarily, uh, you know, a like for like, but it does give you a good idea of what you're generally liking and, you know, attacking on the gram and stuff. But yeah, I think it's a really good feature. Again, I think overall going forward, I wouldn't be surprised if this is a way for them to, I think engagement wise and activity on Instagram, I think if I'm taking myself as an example, I don't use Instagram that often because I don't necessarily get any value from it. Um, and I try to, create and put content out as much as possible as opposed to browsing on it but i think if they take away the option of people to see what you're browsing so you feel less guilty about what people see if they take away the option of people seeing how many posts your how many likes your post gets apart from you seeing yourself it also takes the pressure away from you uploading random stuff and trying new things and getting a little bit of creative because i think maybe some of the content on instagram gets a bit stagnant because people especially same with youtube right you find out what works you find content that works for you and you start kind of regurgitating it that's why sometimes you find a scandal Let's say a Daniel Cohn has kind of got some new scandals happen with this little girl, and you'll see all the major flipping commentary channels on YouTube going for the same angle, talking about the same sort of thing that they're talking about because they know it's easy views. It's, the algorithm will notice it, but you have to get into it. You have to get on it really quickly, the first couple of days, and then you, you suddenly become the first hits. By that time, if you 
attack it later on, it's too late. So maybe the same thing happened with Instagram. People are blowing the same sort of content, it's getting a bit stale. So to mix it up again, they want to make sure people t- that that anxiety of creating things and not getting likes you want is taken away, and also the anxiety of maybe following and liking stuff that you don't say everyone what don't want everyone to know about is taken away too by making sure they remove the following tab. So it's a very clever way to kind of get things get people to get to get people to using the app as it, as intended again. I think it's a very clever way to get around it. Um. I know I'm going to be back on there again now. Um, there's no need for me to have my Finster account. All that malarkey. Oh, Finster, can I say that? What I say? <laughs> but yeah, I think I'm going to be probably doing that more often myself as well. But I can see it becoming a probably more of a way to kind of drive engagement as, as opposed to them just making sure they're uh, enabling creeps to kind of, you know, um, like random Instagram models for images again. I don't know, but I, I'm, I'm a big fan of it. Darkman, I'm a big fan of, and I'm also a big fan of the old um, Ruby with the follow tab. So yeah, recommend you check it out. Re- updates available now for new version of ios 13 and android but i'm sure most of you guys are familiar with that already what else is on here mark zuckerberg is with boss of course he is let's move we'll put that into probably tomorrow's show i think i need to probably read that again to kind of get an idea of what i speak about because i remember putting that lately a long time ago but this is a good one dame dash spoke to um adam 22 from no jumper i'm sure you guys have seen the interview the first one but the second go around where Adam22 went up to uh, Dame Dash Studios to go speak to him, was very insightful and got me thinking about just generally goal setting, right? I think Dame Dash does a lot with people that he speaks to when he does his Dame Dash University stuff, where he kind of throws up the question about what your what does your day-to-day look like 10 years from now? And he's, he's very good at kind of, you know, specking out really big, grandiose goals. Some of it he doesn't able to achieve, but the fact that he's got, he's got his own network, Dame Dash Studios, I mean, he's very entrepreneurial and very big goal orientated right he's not just looking at the kind of service level stuff and of course he's all about ownership and having autonomy and what you're doing and there's something very very eye-opening about how what he said to adam 22 about having 10-year plan right which kind of want to expand on a bit and then we'll talk about it on the other side but here's a clip uh, on youtube that i want to get up on here let's get it on here where is it there you go boom and then we'll speak about what they spoke about right (laughs) who cares about just Doing a lot of interviews. Ten years. What do you want to be in ten years? To me. Um, I want to keep growing the jumper into a brand that could be bigger than. No, what no, no. It is Cut to ten years. Lifestyle brand. Cut to ten years. Ten years. Don't tell me about okay. what you did to get there. What does it look like in ten? Forty-five. Years? Uh, house bigger. How much bigger? I don't know. I just got a house. I'm, I'm having a hard time imagining why I would need a house any bigger than that. That was the first thing you said. Yeah. No, no, no. no. I'm pretty happy with how big the house is, but I'm assuming in ten years maybe it'll be bigger. Um, I don't know. I just want to keep growing the media company it's side of things, like the, the, the content. Listen. Not today, <laughs> but figure out what your dream ultimately is in ten years and visualize. I kind of feel like I'm there in terms of doing the interviews. My AC is broken, so that's definitely one thing that ten years from now I want to have fixed. Like I said, <laughs> 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 just think it through. Mm. You know, this is a conversation you have with yourself. And think about what you want your day to look like in 10 years from when you wake up, if you even have to go to work, to when you go to bed. I feel you, though, because I feel like I'm caught up on a lot of million-dollar dreams right now, and I don't got no billion-dollar dreams. Like, I don't got no, like, crazy big thing that I'm going to invent that's going to change the world type ideas at this point in my life. I'm but just focused on grinding the out the company that I built for myself. And I think that's, that's that's essentially what most people get caught up on, right? I think I'm, I can really identify that in 22 with this. Sometimes you can get too caught up on just making sure that your one major, your one little hustle is really kind of, you know, you're able to kind of build it up from there. But I think what Dame Dash is basically telling him is that um, that ten year plan is probably a lot easier than what you think it is, and it will make the other it will make the steps that you do in between that much easier to decide whether or not to say yes or no to certain things. Because once you have a bigger once you have an idea of where you want to be ten years down the line of what your day actually looks like day to day, it makes the decision in between that easier to do. Because imagine someone like Joe Rogan, I think says a lot how because people are very fascinated a bit about you know how Joe Rogan's able to kind of you know run that operation with Joe Rogan experience and just kind of keep things really low keep things really um really simple right there's probably like three employees that work for him in general apart from the security he has at his compound or at, at his studios it's very kind of you know low key and the way he's able to do it is because he is he put he, he kind of specked out that he wants to continue doing the podcast speaking to interesting people putting his mates on uh, and doing comedy shows and announcing for the UFC 
So it makes all the things in between easy to say no to. So someone says to him, oh, you want to do this TV show? No. You want to go film this reality TV show? No. You want to come in on my, on my appearance on this thing? No. You want to do this collaboration? No. He can say no to so many things because he knows what the actual long-term goal is. He knows his 10 years, 10 years on, he wants to be doing maybe the same amount of dates comedy-wise, maybe, maybe more, maybe a bit less. He wants to be making podcasts five days a week or whatever it be is, taking vacations with his family twice or four times a year. That's the kind of way he wants to do things, but it just starts from that kind of overall goal. And then it kind of makes the other steps that you do in between it much easier to do. And again, I think it's something that you don't necessarily think about in the beginning because you're so desperate just to kind of make sure your one little nut is being satisfied, right? You're making sure that you're kind of getting money in that one little area. But really, if you think about it a little bit more, a little bit more detailed, it can kind of make the other steps a little bit more easy to kind of spark out. And again, something that I kind of gleaned from the interview that I thought was really interesting. I recommend you check it out in general. I'll put the full link of the interview down below in the show notes, but it's something that I'll probably leave you guys to meditate on yourselves to kind of think about as well. But again, it made me kind of think about, you know, what I want to, what do I, what, what does my, what, what, in 10 years time, what does my day to day look like? How, where am I waking up? What time am I waking up? Where am I? What does it look like? What does it smell like? What's the first thing that I do in the morning? Um, where do I have to be? Am I obligated to be somewhere? Um, th- whatever. Those kind of things are really interested to be. Who am I with? What, what do my friends look like? What do my associates look like? All those things are very interesting because they'll make the other steps in between so much easier to do. It's sort of the same sort of thing maybe happening if you're a fighter, right? If you're planning to have a fight and you're kind of trying to cut weight or whatever it may be called. You want to win. You want to make sure when you get to a fight, you get into the best best, best, best possible chance to win. So all decisions in between that and the fight are easy to make. When your friends call you to go out, you're not going to go out anymore because you want to make sure that you're not giving yourself any excuses to why it didn't work out at the end. You just say no here, no there, no there, so that at the end you can say yes to everything and it can all be all rosy. But again, I recommend you check it out. It's an amazing uh, interview. I think Dane Dash, for all his ills and for all his, you know, inconsistencies and some of his deficiencies i think if you strip away all that stuff and you just concentrate on the message i think you can get a lot of value from it and i'm a big fan of his i think over the years he has proved to be somebody of again it's the morals and the and the ideals have maybe landed him in trouble and then kind of maybe ostracize him in some way shape or form but you can only respect the stance that he's taken over the years some of it's been a bit you know a little bit um, OTT the stance the text that he's taken but I think overall I can only respect his kind of point of view and how he's kind of conducted his life over the years and I think you don't have to respect it and hopefully take some heed from it for yourself in the things that you want to do um, going forward but yeah that's it actually I was doing a show episode number 231 thanks so much for tuning in we're getting them in we're banging them out see you again tomorrow for an episode of the show until then um view all my links of stuff that i'm doing at my website xnozinger.com you can find that in the show notes or in the description of the video below if you listen via the podcast app click the little details thing on your screen you're able to see all the show no- links i'll put the damn dash interview down there too for you to click on and view um i'm djing this saturday at the heathcote star so come and check me out if you're around the area and if you're via watching via the youtube and if you like what, I hit, what i'm talking about why not give me a little thumbs up Leave me a comment. Let me know what you think of the episode. Um, if you listen for the first time or you like, you want to see it again, why not subscribe so you get alerted to what I'm doing. If you listen to your podcast app, leave me a little five-star review. It'll go a long way to people to find out what the show is all about. And until then, I'll see you guys again very, very soon. Thank you for listening and take care. Bye. <laughs>